Good morning, everyone. Morning, Dad. Morning. morning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I thought I said good morning. I wasn't sure. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I, I don't want to spend too much time here. Uh, uh, so I'm going to invite my Ruth. She's going to bring the welcome this morning and then say what a prayer on Sunday. That will take you to presence. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Nice to see you all here. <laughs> um, so just to let you know what's coming up in today's service, we have lovely Temi in the band uh, leading us in worship, which will be lovely. Um, and please do, in that time, just feel free to um, just worship how you feel comfortable um, and you can bring any um, scriptures or prayers, just feel free to bring those to us. If you want to bring a picture or prophetic word, you can come and grab a um, dial and you can find a time in the service to bring that to us. Um, we're also going to have communion and after the second song, beginning of the third song, um, we're going to have kids work and youth work as well today. So please feel free to follow up through these doors. Um, we're also going to have um, Jeff come and give the next in his series of The Journey Home. So that's exciting. And then please do feel free to stay around afterwards for tea and coffee and a chat. Um, I am just going to share a quick notice while I'm here as well, uh, which I also shared last week about um, the shoe boxes run by Samaritan's Purse. Um, so I've brought in again uh, some shoe boxes at the back and some leaflets like this. Um, if you want to get involved, then you can grab one of these leaflets, you can find some nice um, items to put in there, and then bring in your shoe boxes on the 13th of November, which is in two weeks' time. Um, also, just to say, if you don't want to do a whole shoe box but want to collect a few items or you've got some at home, then please do feel free to bring those in and give them to me because on the 30th of November, the children's groups are going to be doing shoe boxes and writing some cards and things so we can compile those into those boxes, which would be good. Um, okay, I just want to read a few verses from Psalm 145. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is faithful to all his promises and loving to all, towards all he has made. The Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. Father God, we just want to come towards you today and just fix our eyes on you and um, throw off everything else that hinders us. Um, we just want to pray and thank you that your kingdom reigns, that your dominion will reign forever and ever, that you're faithful to all your promises, that you provide everything that we need, and that you satisfy our hearts' desires. Amen. Amen. Okay, if you want to stand, I'll have a tell you. We stand and lift up our hands. We stand and lift up our hands. For the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship Him now. How great, how awesome is He. And together we sing.
God of all things. In you, through you, all things are made. We thank you, God, because you are worthy of our praise. Lord, we worship you and adore you. We bless your holy name. Yeah. 
Why don't we lift a shout this morning to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He is alive. He, was, he died and he rose from the dead. From that song, let's raise a shout this morning. Come on. Let your voices run in this place this morning. 1 Corinthians 15 says that if Jesus did not rise from the dead, we are of men most miserable. He died and he rose. He's alive. He's a savior of the world. Oh, we lift up our voices this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive. Oh, death is defeated. Oh, we have victory in Christ Jesus this morning. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. We raise a shout this morning. We lift our voices to you this morning. Knowing that you died and you rose from the dead. It's no fantasy. It is not a fantasy. It happened. It happened. It happened. And that is why we are living witnesses. We come here every Sunday to say he died and he rose from the dead. We are living witnesses of what you have done. The Savior of the world. The Savior of the world. Oh, what a joy to know the Savior of the world. I wish the world knows that it is Savior. I wish everybody knows that it is Savior called the Savior of the world. But we are grateful that we know him this morning. What a joy. What a joy. What a joy. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom. My steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. But I am not forsaken For by my side The Savior He will stay I labor on In weakness and rejoicing For in my need His power is displayed To this I hold My shepherd will I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon. And he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold my sin been defeated Jesus now and ever is my plea all the chains are released I can sing I am free yet not I but through Christ in me with every breath I long to follow Jesus 
for he has said that he will bring me home and day by day I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne to this I To see the dawn of the darkest day, Christ on the road to Calvary, tried by sinful men, torn and beaten then, nailed to a cross of wood. Two. Yeah. 
forgiven at the cross and I just want to take this moment to uh, come to the communion table um, everything we've been doing since we started is just validating what Christ has done for us he died on the cross so we stand forgiven so when we take the communion we remind ourselves of what he has done for us and the good thing as well is Jeff is bringing the word about journey home and I just want to read the place in 1 Corinthians um, 15. It says, And if there's no, there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation is in vain. So when we talk about Johnny home, we believe that he died, he rose, he's coming back, and it's a place called home that we are going. And that's why we do what we do. So we come to the communion table today because we know that he died for us. And we know he's coming back. And we know we have a place called home that one day we'll see him face to face. Isn't that amazing? That's just amazing to know that this is not just, this is a temporary home. There's a place called home. And we're on a journey to that place. So I want us to just come to the communion table today. So. Um, if I ask uh, Duncan and Martin to help us on this side, what a joy for a pastor to serve us in communion this morning. That's amazing, isn't it? And um, Lindsay and Fumi as well, if that's okay, you can just help us on this other side. Uh, please, uh, when you're ready, I, I just had this picture. I don't know, uh, um, uh, there's a, a book by John Bunyan, Break and Progress, and he said there was a time when the guy got to the cross and all the weight, all the burden just dropped off. If you're in this place this morning and you feel burdened, you feel like, oh, what's going on? As you take the communion this morning, just say, God, I just put everything down at the cross. I stand forgiving. I stand restored. So whatever it is you're going through this morning, as you take the communion, just imagine Christ on the cross. He has paid it all. He paid it all for us. Hallelujah. Let's, let's, let's take the communion now. Just bless God. So I can go and take communion.
I've just got a little picture to share with you that I had sitting in the back there. Quite a simple picture of a birdcage with the door open. And there's a canary in there, a little yellow canary, which normally would sing, sing its little heart out. I'm close to tears because this, this canary has stopped singing. This canary can't sing because it's burdened. It can't, it can't sing the song that it wants to sing. There's something within it that's preventing it from singing. And the Lord is standing outside of the cage with, and the door is open and he's beckoning this little canary, this, this beautiful little canary that can't sing and he's saying, come out, come out. Don't stay in whatever it is in the past that has held you back. It stopped you singing, but the Lord wants you to sing again. And so what he's saying to you this morning is, come out of the cage, take that step of faith and come out and the Lord is there for you. You are forgiven, but forgive yourself and let God just release that song in you again. The canary sings beautifully and if you do as the Lord is saying, you're going to start singing again so beautifully. Wow, wow. I think that's a very good picture. And I actually thought what Wendy brought last week about the Father's hand around us, regardless of, of where we are. So I just want us to respond to that. Um, if you're in a place where you feel burdened this morning, 1 Peter 5, 7 says, so casting all your cares on him, for he cares for you. So why don't you just, like I said, like the picture just died with what I said earlier about the cross as well. Just bringing your burdens and just laying it down at his feet. Say, Lord, I just gave it to you. Jesus said, take my yoke. He said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. And say, you will find rest for your soul. I didn't say, God, this morning, I just, I just bring all my worries, my burdens. I just lay it down at your feet this morning. And say, Lord, just I take your yoke upon me. Your yoke is easy. Your burden is light. And I enter into your rest this morning. I enter into rest this morning. And I will sing again. I will sing again. He said, there is hope for a tree. <laughs> if it is cut down. He said, at the scent of water, it will rise again. I will sing again. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Yeah, Lord, we, we received that word this morning, Lord. Wherever we are in our journey, we just lay it down before you this morning. And as we take this next song, I want you to just sing with all of your heart. Just sing. He's the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. Let's, let's declare His kingship and His kingdom over our lives. We were waiting without hope, without light So from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin king the world From the throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt Praise forever 
forever the king of kings hallelujah thank you so much guys thank you Tammy, john ade and the latest member of the band ronnie thank you so much for stepping up this morning that was enjoyable we really loved it thank you so much for the peace happy seats um yeah uh, uh, very quickly uh, um i i want to ask some Elvina, she's got uh, a testimony of God's promises and faithfulness to just share with us very quickly. So we want to come forward. Can we give her a round of applause? <laughs> yeah, it can be so. <laughs> Actually, I'm not very comfortable over here. <laughs> I'm very nervous. Uh, but still, uh, I just gathered myself and I said, I have to share this. Um, if you all don't know me, to introduce myself, I'm Joyston's wife. And I've got two lovely kids. Elena, who's seven years old, and Daniela, who's going to be 15 months old now. Uh, so the thing is that Dayo messaged me yesterday saying that, uh, Elena, you want to share about God's faithfulness and growth since having Daniela and I, I didn't answer to him very quickly I said I took my time uh, at first I was very reluctant and then I, I just said I have to do this you know and I just said yes and till now like I'm a bit confused what I'm going to do and what I'm going to say uh, but yeah um, this is what it is two years back I was praying for a child <clears throat> because Elena was already five years and uh, we moved to this country and lots was going on and but the, I had the desire in my heart to have a child um, and the other thing that I was struggling was to register myself as a band five nurse in this country lots of exams to answer so I was I was with lots of things in my head going around and this desire for a child was deep inside me and I put it in prayer to the Lord. I said, Lord, I want this child, make it possible. And then what happened is that it was getting delayed, I was getting frustrated and I was thinking, what is happening? Why the Lord is not answering my prayers? And one Sunday, same like today, how Flavia brought the word. She brought the word at the time we were in the Ashcroft building. <coughs> and she said that someone has been praying and the Lord has heard her prayer. And her request has been accepted and he's going to answer it in his time. Soon after the service, I met with her. She prayed for me. And I was happy that the Lord has heard my prayer. And I just kept myself on that word. That my Lord is going to answer my prayer. I brought my strength from Psalm 62. But still it was getting delayed. 
Elena came once to me and said, Mama, why is the Lord not giving us a babe? And I said, the Lord is choosing the best. And we need to wait. And we waited. And in the month of August, my registration got done. And then soon in December, I conceived. And I leaped like a baby. I jumped. Joyston doesn't know about it. I went to my room, I jumped. I said, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord, I said. You answered my prayer. And what a joy it was. After that, it was not easy. The whole pregnancy, I went through anemia. Every time my blood showed anemia. But the gods and my Jesus, he strengthened me. I didn't have not even the slightest symptom of anemia. I remember sitting in the car and telling Joyston after the appointment, I said, the doctor is saying my bloods don't look good, very anemic, but I am not having the symptom. I'm not feeling anything about it. And I said, Lord, how you help your children in these times when the reports are showing something, the doctor is saying something. The next hurdle was by the time I was 36 weeks, my waters broke. So I got very scared the morning that I got up and it happened. I don't know what took over me. I was cold. And I said, Lord, I don't know what is this. I'm in a different country. I was very scared because I know Elena was a C-section baby. And Daniela, I was not ready this time for a C-section. Another big hurdle, another big problem. But this time I look at my problems and I don't see them problems anymore from that, that moment. I started seeing them as mountains. I refer to my problems now as mountains. And I said, Lord, this is a mountain. And who can move the mountains? Only my Lord. Only my Jesus can move the mountain for me. I was admitted to QA, given antibiotics. I waited for four, four days. And my church family has been very kind and very faithful and prayed for me during this whole time. They were there with me. Their prayers were there with me. And I felt the presence of the Lord even I was in the hospital because of COVID. Joyce still couldn't stay for long. Just the timings and he's gone. But the Lord strengthened me. The doctors thought they will try for a normal delivery to induce me. But Daniela was not in the preferred position. And then I had to be rushed for an emergency cesarean. And I said, Lord, I give this mountain into your hands because you are the God who moves mountains. <laughs> After the cesarean, the doctor came to me and he told me, you lost a lot of blood comparatively to the others. You know, uh, what they do. And I, in my head, I'm thinking, I'm already an anemic. But here, yeah, again, the Lord, being so kind to me, looked on me. And he has blessed me so much. And when I looked at Daniela, the very thought that came to my mind was, my God has been faithful. Mm -hmm. He answered my prayers. He fulfilled the desires of my heart mm -hmm. with this baby. Mm -hmm. At 36 weeks, she was very small. Three months of sleepless nights to look after her, to love her, to care for her. But in doing this, the Lord showed me his love, how he looks at his children. Even though we are not bothered and go about doing our work, he looks at his children, his constant eye. We are the apple of his eyes. And he was looking after and gave me the strength to look after this small child. And both my children have drawn me closer to him, knowing him as a loving father. I have experienced Jesus in a very close way. And today I want to give all the glory, honor and praise to my Jesus 
who has provided for me, who has sustained me, and who has been very, very, very faithful to me and my family. And I want to end it with, say, uh, with the Psalm 18, verse 1. I love you, O Lord, my strength. Thank you, Judge. Thank you so much, Alvina, <laughs> for sharing. Uh, God bless you real good. Um, very quickly, I just want to bring... Uh, so tomorrow, we have the light party on um, half six tomorrow. So everyone is aware, the kids are aware. So light party tomorrow, half six, please. Dress in your hammer, come and, and do that. So half six to eight uh, here, we'll be meeting. Then on Tuesday, there's a um, prayer meeting at uh, Wellington Village, so please do well to come. And the rest of the notices, you have, you have one of these, we have the church website as well. Please do well to, to check uh, the re all the notices and on Thursday we have the men's um, dinner together so please men uh, note that in your diary. Uh, I'll bring uh, Jeff and he's going to take us through the journey home series that he started. Uh, God bless you guys. Can you say hello to somebody next to you while he gets himself ready? Okay that's enough. Okay, so if you have your Bibles, your second sermon this morning is going to be the continuation. <laughs> Let's just pray. Father, we thank you that what we're looking at are truths that are beyond our comprehension. Uh, thank you that this isn't just some vain hope we have, but this is reality. This is what will happen. And we just worship you in our hearts and with our mouths and say, oh God, without you, what hope is there? There is none. So we bless you. We love you. Amen. Amen. So we're continuing the Journey Home series. Some of you may think, haven't we got there yet? Actually, <laughs> we've got a few more to go. And this morning, we're going to look at the whole subject of Judgment Day. If you remember, we've, we've gone through what happens when we die heaven and hell, and now this is Judgment Day. So this is when Jesus has returned and he assembles all persons, living and dead together. So I'll just give you a flavour by reading from Revelation 20, beginning verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, the earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the, thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. It's a picture of that day when we all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And I'll unpick that a little bit more next week. But this day is inescapable. Whether you believe in Jesus, whether you don't, whether you believe in some other religion, it is with greatest respect, irrelevant. This day, you will not escape. Hebrews 9 tells us that people are destined to die once and after that, face judgment. Some of you are old enough to remember Eamon Holmes with his program, This Is, this is Your Life. He was, he was Irish, which was pretty rubbish, wasn't it? But do you remember that, where he came in with a big, big red book? Well, guys, this will be your life on that day. The books are opened, and in those books are records of all our deeds. And this day, this judgment day, is regularly highlighted throughout Scripture. In John 5, Jesus says, Whoever hears my words and believe him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed from death to life. There's a distinction for the Christian and the non-Christian on this day. The Christian will give an account for their life. 
but we'll come to that next week. The non-Christian will be judged as to their eternity. For Christians, we are assured that come that day, we know where we go. We will be with Jesus. For the non-Christian, they'll primarily be utterly shocked and surprised and desperate. And God throughout Scripture has, con- has made judgments. Noah's flood, remember, was because of the evil of humanity. The Tower of Babel was for the arrogance of humanity. Sodom and Gomorrah for the immorality of humanity. Individuals are judged by God, nations were judged by God, and even angels have been judged by God. God, as creator of all things, has every right to call those he created to account. He sets the standards and he calls us to account for our lives according to his standards. As I say, the Christian's outcome is assured. And next week we will look into that more. We will look into the whole issue of next week, next time, eternal rewards. What are they? Can we lose them? And if we can lose them, what are the consequences? But I want to say at the outset, your eternity with Jesus is utterly assured because of your faith in him, not because of your works. But today, what I want to do is to help us understand the utter necessity for this day of judgment and how its reality should affect us for every day of our life. And there are four key areas or four key ways that this judgment day should affect you and I today, tomorrow, etc. The first reason is this, is that a day of judgment for all humanity satisfies the need for justice in our hearts. We all cry out, don't we, when we hear of a heinous crime and the perpetrator seems to get off scot-free. When somebody does something to us and there's no consequence or accountability for them, there's something in us that cries that is just not right. And on the other hand, we agree when a court sentences a convict or a person to a long, lengthy term in prison for their crimes. There's something in us that says that's absolutely how it should be. That is justice. You see, there is, need, there is a need in each of us to see justice dispensed. Without a day of judgment, why should anyone try to live to a better standard of life. If there was no accountability for our lives, why would we bother? Why would an unbeliever even bother? Why try to be kind, considerate and selfless? Where is restraint? Is that if there is no consequence? If there's no judge who sits on the bench, there's no hope. Every human being conceived will face God and books will be opened and their life's actions and choices will be called to account. And until then, justice on earth may not be seen. People do get away with things that we think they shouldn't. But no one will escape the ultimate day of judgment. Whether you're rich or poor, emperors or slaves, famous or unknown, no matter who you are or what you believe, the Bible repeatedly warns us that we will all stand before God and give account for our lives. In Revelation 6, there's this wonderful picture around the throne of God where the martyrs, people who had been executed who had lost their life on earth for their faith in Jesus, where they're crying out to God and they say, how long until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? This voice is going to the throne of God saying, how long until we see justice for what they did to us? The Psalms 
Many of them regularly speak about God. Why do the wicked prosper? And then you find later, they find comfort in the fact that one day they will be called to account. And if you read through Jeremiah, it's a similar story. That Jeremiah is crying out, where is justice? But finds comfort that God will judge these people one day. Knowing there is a day of judgment satisfies our inbuilt need for justice in our hearts and brings comfort when we are the recipients of wickedness and evil. Christians of all ages have understood this as they have suffered for their faith. Indeed, still, still, we read stories of Christians today who are burnt alive for their faith, beheaded, oppressed. And yet, this doctrine is here, this day is here, so that they can find some comfort at that time. I'm going to read you one of my favourite stories. In AD 155, so it wasn't so soon after Jesus had returned to the Father, Polycarp, the Bishop of Smyrna, now Smyrna is a, a, an area and you can see it in one of the seven letters in Revelation. So Polycarp, the Bishop of Smyrna, was burnt alive. Let me read you what happened. Polycarp, Bishop of Smyrna, was martyred on Saturday the 23rd of February, AD 155. It was the time of the public games. The city was crowded and the crowds were excited. Suddenly the shout went up, away with the atheists. Let Polycarp be searched for. No doubt Polycarp could have escaped, but already he had had a dream vision in which he saw the pillow under his head burning with fire and he had wakened to tell his disciples, I must be burnt alive. His whereabouts were betrayed by a slave who collapsed under torture. They came to arrest him. He ordered that they should be given a meal and provided with all they wished whilst he asked for himself the privilege of one last hour in prayer. Not even the police captain wished to see Polycarp die. On the brief journey to the city, he pleaded with the old man, what harm is it to say Caesar is Lord and to offer a sacrifice and be saved? But Polycarp was adamant that for him only Jesus Christ was Lord. When he entered the arena, there came a voice from heaven saying, be strong Polycarp and play the man. The proconsul gave him the choice of cursing the name of Christ and making sacrifice to Caesar or death. Polycarp said, 80 and six years have I served him. He has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? The proconsul threatens him with burning and Polycarp replied, you threaten me with the fire that burns for a time and is quickly quenched for you do not know the fire which awaits the wicked in the judgment to come and in everlasting punishment. Why are you waiting? Come do what you will. Isn't that a great way to die? Isn't that? But you see Polycarp tied to the stake and actually they didn't tie him. He stood there. He didn't let them tie him. He said, I will not move. Polycarp saw that though he may suffer briefly, his need for justice would be met because one day they would face his God. The day of judgment that we will all face and experience satisfies that inner need in us for justice. But there's, that goes on to the second point. The certainty of a day of judgment enables me to forgive those who wrong me. Paul said in Romans 12, do not take revenge, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. How can the parent of a murdered or abused child be able to forgive and not seek revenge? How can loved ones forgive the terrorists the militants who bomb, behead, or torture their family and their friends? How can we show restraint, restraint and help others not to take up the gun 
in order to seek their revenge. How can we forgive when these atrocious things happen? Because as Christians, God tells us, revenge is his, not ours. And Jesus demonstrates this. Peter says in his first letter, 1 Peter 2, Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Jesus, when he suffered on the cross, wasn't seeking revenge on those people. He entrusted judgment to the Father. Forgiveness is not trying to forget about the incident, but it's a conscious decision to release the pain and your need for justice into the hands of him who will judge justly. Personally, I would much rather trust God's justice than my definition of it. I think mine may be a little prejudice to suit what I think. For those who do not know Jesus personally, every sin, every act of evil, every rebellious moment, every rejection of Jesus Christ will be revealed and will be punished for nothing will escape his attention. So God's day of judgment enables me to forgive and not seek revenge, even though it may hurt, even though at the time it may see un seem unfair, because I will entrust my need for justice to him who will judge justly. And then thirdly, a day of judgment motivates me to live to please God. And as I keep saying, because <laughs> I'm advertising it a lot, I'll go into this more next time. But my acts of faith, my good works, the sacrifice that I make, all account for something. There are rewards to receive and there are rewards to lose. In Matthew 6, Jesus likens our good, good decisions as storing treasure in heaven so that my eyes and heart can look to that time where then, when those treasures are revealed. What they are, we'll go into next time. But knowing that what I do or what I don't do, or what I do with the wrong motives, all counts towards me or against me, should motivate me to please God. We can talk like this because we're hopefully building a foundation in our church that we understand we are saved by grace through our faith in Jesus Christ. And that is a foundation that nothing can shake. But we also have to be real to recognize that is not a liberty to live as we please. That's a liberty to serve God and to seek to honor him by the way we live. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 3, by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. 
If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day, he's talking about the day of judgment or accountability, will bring it to light. It will be re revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, okay? Even though only as one escaping through the flames. Dear friends, recognizing that one day my life will be held to account before God motivates me to actually serve him for his glory and purposes. Motivates me to make the right choices. Motivates me to make sure my motives are pure in the choices I make. We may gain reward or we may suffer loss, yet we will be saved from the eternal fire. Fourthly, knowing there is a day of judgment must surely, surely shake any indifference I may have towards the plight of the un unsaved. Surely I cannot be indifferent to the plight of friends, neighbours, family, strangers, work colleagues who don't know Jesus. The reality of that day of judgment, knowing what will happen, come on. Surely it means we're beyond this, oh, I'm a bit nervous about talking about Jesus, or I don't know whether they'll love me, or accept me, or make fun of me. When we understand their consequences, surely it should move us to share with them, pray for them, demonstrate to them that there is a God. And whether they know him or not, one day they will stand before him and give an account. So I hope you can see why there must be a day of judgment. Justice needs to be done. God's day of judgment enables me to forgive so that God can hold the revenge that I may feel in his righteous hands. The day of judgment motivates me to live to please God because my life will be held account, accountable. And the day of judgment surely must challenge me to share my faith and the truth about Jesus. But let me say this. Who can stand before God on merit alone? I'm sure you, like me, over the years have talked to many people who don't know Jesus, think they know God, and basically their definition of whether they're going to heaven or hell is based on, well, I'm better than him down the road or her down the road, or I haven't ever done this, but I may have done that. But the balance is weighed in my favour. And yet the Bible clearly warns us we have all sinned and all fallen short of God's standards. And the consequence of that, on that day, if we stand before God with that st sin still in a book, which God has, is that we are cast into the eternal lake of fire, eternally separated from the presence of God. Yet, because of Jesus, this is not the end story for all of us. For he came, as we've sung this morning, as Dio's spoken. He came as our propitiation. He came as the one to appease an angry party. God was furious with our sin, demanding justice. And in his grace, he dispensed his justice on none other than the one who would judge us. So there is hope for that day. But that hope is only found in the person of Jesus Christ. And we only recognize our need for Jesus when we recognize our need to be forgiven. Jesus isn't something or someone we tack on 
to our life. We do a few religious things, go to a few religious meetings. We say a few religious sentences. Jesus is only relevant to us when we recognize our need for forgiveness, for disobeying God. And our fear of standing before him to give an account with no merit of our own. Then we realize, now I see why Jesus came. Now I see why he suffered. Now I understand that by my faith in him and receiving him as my Lord, God takes my sin and the justice he would dispense on my sin and places it on the shoulder of his son. It's an exchange like no other. God takes our punishment and places it on Jesus and then takes Jesus' righteousness, his right standing with God, and places it on us. You will never get a better offer throughout eternity. In Isaiah 53, <coughs> Isaiah said he was crushed for our iniquities. Speaking of Jesus, the punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. You see, sin that is not forgiven by God chains us. An impending punishment enslaves us. And I cannot come before God with any merit of my own. There is no good works I or anyone who's ever been born can do that will hide their sin. Yet the one who sits on the throne says, will you receive me as your Lord and Saviour? Will you lay down your life and choose to follow me? And if we say yes, then with tears of joy and humility, we hear the smashing of chains and we're set free. Because all that condemnation and guilt and impending justice and judgment that was on me is placed on him. My question this morning is, guys, are you sure you've made the right decision? You see, no decision is a decision. Not to accept Jesus is to reject him. Has your punishment for your sin been placed on his shoulders and have, in turn, you receive the Holy Spirit because of your faith in him who affirms to you inside that the transaction is complete. If not, then today you can know that freedom, not because of any clever words. But I don't use clever words, but not because of any words I've said. But because God in his spirit is saying to you deep inside, you really don't want to face me on that day without having your sins paid for. The day of God's judgment satisfies our inbuilt desire for justice. It enables us to forgive others. It motivates us to live lives to please him. And it urges us to go and tell others of the benefits of knowing Jesus Christ. But dear friends, come that moment which we will all experience when the books that we read about in Revelation are opened. The most important thing will be which book is opened when your name is called out. If it's not the book of life that has stamped across it, paid in full, then it will be the alternative book which will lead you to an eternal separation from God. Which book is yours? Let's pray, shall we? Lord Jesus, we just want to say to you, we're just humbled by your goodness. We're moved and 
changed by your amazing love that you pour out upon us. We talk and we try and capture pictures of these truths in scripture and our comprehension and imagination cannot grasp it. But that which is of most importance you have made clear to us. And we want to thank you that because of our faith in you and because we know the Holy Spirit lives in us, we are, we are in the book of life. But Lord, I do pray. I pray for my brothers and sisters, Lord God. I pray that where there is a cry for justice in their hearts, that day would be a comfort to them to know that justice will be served. If it's not on the shoulders of Jesus Christ, then it will be in the eternal lake of fire where there is an unforgiveness because of wrong that has been done to us. I want to pray, Holy Spirit, right now you would enable us to say in our hearts, justice, or rather revenge, is the Lord's, not mine. And I pray you would bring healing where there's been bitterness and unforgiveness. Lord Jesus, I pray for our lives, that we don't strive to live to please you, to earn something, that we already have like our salvation. But because of our salvation, we are motivated to respond in love and give ourselves to serve you. I pray, may we be men and women who passionately live for your glory. And Lord Jesus, forgive us for our indifference towards the lost, for our complacency about their plight and would you renew in us a desire to proclaim this wonderful message at every opportunity, making and creating opportunities and living in such a way that others would look at us and say, what is there about you that's so different? And may this all be for your glory. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day. See you soon. See you Tuesday night.